Art comes in many forms. Photographs, paintings, music, plays, and even writing. Each of these art forms differs in their own way, but they are united through the artist's desire to share something with the world. Christine, an art fanatic, loved this the most about many types of art. She appreciated the beauty within a work of art, but more importantly, longed to learn the backstory behind each masterpiece and the emotion that brought it to life. This is why she had decided to major in art history, and it is also why she could not resist visiting a quaint art gallery while passing through a small town during the summer break. The art gallery seemed like something out of a storybook. It blended in with its surroundings, but once noticed, it seemed to stand out from the rest of the now drab buildings around it. In fact, nothing about the structure indicated that it was an art gallery, but something about it made Christine think that it was. Thus, with anticipation and excitement, Christine rushed in through the small front door and was thoroughly pleased to find that there was no admission fee. She could enter for free. Christine continued along the hallway until she reached a small room. This was the only room that the hallway led to, so Christine was quite confused to find that three of the four walls were bare. However, when she approached the fourth wall, she found a small painting about the size of a cell phone. Although small, the painting stood out starkly against the rest of the bare wall, and there was something entirely unique about it. It was nothing like she had ever seen before, so much so that she could not explain it. She was at a loss for words. All the famous pieces she had studied and adored while in university suddenly faded into the back of her mind, because they were nothing like the masterpiece in front of her. Entranced by the painting, Christine was startled when a man spoke up next to her. I see you've taken a liking to the painting. They say it looks different to each person who is lucky enough to see it. It seems to capture so many emotions at once. Longing, joy, sadness, grief, and love. And Christine realized that this man was right. The painting embodied everything she had ever known in her life and so much more, she suspected, than she would ever know. Wanting to learn more about the piece, Christine asked the man about the story behind the painting, and so he spoke to her of a craftsman who had set to create a work of art that was unlike anything that had ever been witnessed before. The craftsman's skill was unmatched, some would even say perfect, and he poured his love into his masterpiece. Once he had finally finished, it was evident that he did not fall short of his promise. It was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Anyone who was fortunate enough to behold it was touched in a profound way and could not describe the piece in any other way than perfect. And Christine agreed, the painting was perfect. But she was also puzzled. Why was such a glorious creation tucked away in such a small town, hidden from the rest of the world's eyes? The man said that the craftsman, in fact, created thousands of these paintings, each unique in its own way, but equally perfect. One only had to look to find them. Christine looked at the man in shock, utterly fascinated by this craftsman. After what felt like hours, Christine decided to finally leave the gallery. Thanking the man repeatedly for telling her this beautiful story, she left the gallery and walked towards the bus she had to catch. Before getting on the bus, though, she turned around one last time, only to find that the gallery had disappeared. Suddenly feeling a weight in her pocket, she reached inside to find the painting within her hands. Christine smiled to herself and held the painting to her heart, promising to cherish this perfect gift for as long as she lived. So in the story, we're told that Christine saw hundreds of different paintings throughout her life, but it was the masterpiece that she saw in the hallway that struck her differently, and she couldn't quite figure out why. In our lives, we interact with hundreds of different people, but what really makes someone stand out in the way they act is their love for God because someone's love for God is directly translated into their love for other people. The second point that I really liked in the story was the um, statement, the craftsman's skill was unmatched, some would even say perfect, and he poured out his love into his masterpiece. So the craftsman is a representation of God, because God's skill is unmatched, and he did um, make us perfect in his eyes. God did take his time on us, and he knew us before we even born, and he did love us before we started living, knowing full well that we grow up and make the mistakes that we do every single day. In his eyes, we are his masterpieces, and God doesn't create something he doesn't think is beautiful. After he finished 
after he finished his creation, he saw what he made and he called it good and it was pleasing to him. So it's interesting to ask um, whether every time we point out our flaws or focus on the little things about ourselves that we don't like, if it actually hurts him and if we're accusing him of making these mistakes when in reality, in his eyes, we are perfect. We need to think of that also before we start comparing ourselves to other people. Um, if we're artwork in his eyes, a Da Vinci and a Picasso painting are very different, but they're still both beautiful and they're still both art to him. And God did make um, both very different for a reason. So God did make us all unique for a specific reason. Um, and just how we should look at ourselves in this way, we should look at other people in the same way with the same lack of judgment. Um, because if the person in front of me is perfect in God's eyes, who am I to judge otherwise and say that they're not? And who am I to focus on someone's flaws if God thinks that we're all perfect in His eyes? And even though it's a really important to take on um, how we're made in His image, this can go in another direction and we can focus it more on like behavior and more on our actions. Because we are made in God's image, but that includes the way we think and the way we act and the way we carry ourselves in the world. Um, we are representatives for Christ in the world and therefore what the secular world or the atheistic world thinks of God is actually what they think of us and the way we act and the way we behave. Because they don't have God's word to judge him, they just have us. Um, and the biggest thing we can do to show who God is, is to love other people. And that's why God wants our love to others to be perfect. If we look at the context of the verse, you shall be perfect in Matthew 5, 48, um, we see that Jesus is talking about love, which makes sense because God is love. So if he's perfect, that means his love is perfect. In the passage um, this verse is in, God talks about the difference between the way a believer and a non-believer love. And he says that it's normal for us to love our brothers and our neighbors because it's almost expected. Even a tax collector does these things. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort on our part to love someone that's already nice and kind to us. Perfect love, according to God, is the kind of love that you show to your enemies, the people that you might not like or that might not like you, those that persecute you, those that bully you, um, those that don't treat you in a way that makes it easy to love them. Jesus had people that hated him, that bullied him, that persecuted him, but he never once used that as an excuse to show hatred instead of love. And yes, it is a lot easier said than done, um, but that's why a lot of people don't do it. And that's what makes Christianity different, like the way people love. Um, it might sound crazy or paradoxical in a lot of ways, but that's because that's the nature of God's love. It doesn't make sense a lot of the times. To apply this, before we think that our hatred or our dislike for people in our lives are justified or that they deserve it, um, it's important to remember how much we deserve and how much we're not getting because God chose to love us instead of to um, give us the justice that we actually deserve. And if God loves us unconditionally, even though we nailed him to a cross, we can try to love the people around us even though they might upset us in the smallest way possible sometimes. It's almost hypo hypocritical to judge or not forgive when God has to forgive us so much every single day. Um, and I think that's what differentiates believers from non-believers. It's just the way they love, the way they forgive and the way they treat people. Christianity isn't really convincing to a secular and atheistic world if our actions are no different from that of an atheist. For the world to get a taste of God's goodness and God's love, we need to reflect those qualities in ourselves as well and we need to align our character with God's character because for some people, we are the closest thing to knowing God that they'll ever experience. The last point is the statement, why was such a glorious creation tucked away in such a small town and hidden from the world's sight? So we sometimes question why we're placed where we are and why we're not in a different position or a different circumstance. But the truth is that God did place us where we need to be and where he thinks we need to be at the moment. We might not be able to see this, um, but there is a purpose behind the location that we're in and the timing that we're living in. Because you have access right now to specific resources that can help you give glory to God. And we have access to specific people that can help us do this. We also have access to people that God may want us to help. God plants you where he needs you to bear fruit. Um, and you have talents that benefit people around you and you have specific skill set that God gave you that is unique to you. So it is important to think of it this way when we're considering like why we are in this location, in this timing. Um, God knows how unique you are and how unique he made you and he needs you where you are to help the people around you. I can 
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. In the Sermon of the Mount mentioned in the book of St. Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7, the Lord Jesus Christ commands us to be perfect, just as our Father in heaven is perfect. Someone may ask, how is it possible to be perfect like God himself? The word perfect in the Bible was used for God and for human. However, the Bible expresses perfection in two different contexts. First context for God, the absolute perfection. And second context for humans, the relative perfection. Firstly, the absolute perfection, which is a quality that belongs to God alone. As in this verse, setting God as an example of perfection, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Or anything that relates to God, like for example, His way. As for God, His way is perfect in Psalm 18 verse 30. His law, the law of the Lord is perfect in Psalm 19 7. Or His knowledge, one who is perfect in knowledge is with you, Job 36 4. Or his will, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God in Romans 12, 2. Secondly, the relative perfection, which is for human. For as humans, we do not have absolute perfection. The perfection that we can attain is a relative perfection. Relatively, meaning based on the level of maturity, like adult, youth, or child, or more specifically, the level of spiritual maturity, not depending on the age, or human's capabilities, or the grace of God given to each one of us. And here are some examples. In the Old Testament, human 
was called perfect when he devoted his heart to God. Like Noah in Genesis 6 verse 9, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Or Job in chapter 1 verse 1 and 8 and chapter 2 verse 3, he was a blameless and upright man. Perfect here means righteous, blameless or upright. And in the New Testament, St. James in his epistle, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Perfect here means spiritually mature. Now, since we understood the meaning of perfection, in the Bible, the absolute perfection and the relative perfection, what does it mean for me to be perfect? Here is an example to illustrate the meaning. John is in elementary school and he always scores a full mark in math. He reached an advanced level of math. His teacher indicated that John is perfect in math in his report card. However, we know that perfect here does not mean that John is at the same level of his teacher, but it means he is relatively perfect according to his age or his maturity level or his capabilities and according to what he was taught. John, as he gets older, he grows and moves up from the level of perfection in the elementary school to the level of perfection in the middle school then the high school, and so on until university. However, each level of perfection is relative, depending on his age, maturity level, his capabilities, and the courses has been taught. John would never consider himself to have become perfect in math, for there are always higher and higher levels to reach. The same way we use math as an example, this can apply to any other subject, science, arts, music, and so on. And this also can apply to the virtues. The Bible is also talking about attaining perfection in virtues. Like this example, the Lord Jesus Christ used in Matthew 5, verses 43 to 47, before his commandment, you shall be perfect. He was talking about one of the virtues. He was talking about love. He said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, which if you do and apply in your life, you will grow in this virtue of love, and it will lift you to the divine standard of perfection and to be perfect and this is similarly for any other virtues like praying, fasting, giving, etc. Now knowing what does it mean to be perfect, the next question is how can I be perfect? The Lord is setting an example for us and this example is himself. You shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. And also St. Peter in his first epistle, chapter 2, verse 21, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Perfection does not mean a sinless life, does not mean a life without sin. Pope Shenouda III said, Before you reach perfection, there are levels. First level is, life of repentance and you can achieve this level when you live a life first refrain from sin and that will grow to hate the sin but this life of repentance is called a negative approach and second level is the life of righteousness and a life of righteousness first you can achieve it by virtues, attaining virtues, and second, grow in these virtues. That's the spiritual growth. And that second level, the life of righteousness, is called positive approach. 
It's everyone's duty to strive for perfection, but we can never say that we have reached it. In any case, the path to perfection has stages. As soon as a person reaches one of them, he finds a higher stage awaiting him, and he becomes like someone pursuing the horizon. St. Paul in his epistle to Philippians chapter 3 verse 12 Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He is simply saying that nobody can claim that he attained this goal of perfection, even St. Paul himself. But that does not mean to stop at any certain level. That's why he continues saying in the next verse, verse 13, One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. It's like a car battery. As long as the car is moving, the batteries get charged and keeps going. And when we park it for long time, weeks and months, the battery gets dead and needs boosting. My beloved, if the great Saint Paul did not consider that he had become perfect, he who said, by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me, in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 10, he whom the grace of God was with, and who labored abundantly, said, not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, and that he needed to strive more and more, and strain to reach it, what can we say about ourselves then? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. A quote from St. Augustine. May God, who is always perfect, grow and grow in you. The more you understand him, the more he seems to be growing inside you. Yet man himself seems as if he is decreasing when he falls off his self-glory and replaces it with God's glory. Perfection is a trait that is confined to God alone. And because we are his children, he demanded us to resemble him, saying, Be perfect. For perfection is the image God meant us to be in since the beginning. And thus God created man, not lacking anything. Yet because of man's fall, man lost his perfection. And when Christ the Lord God came to us and renewed our fallen nature, he returned to demanding perfection of us. He demanded of us the perfection of love and called us to love everyone with no expectation of a return and even to love those who trespass against us. He called us to pray all the time for each person and to forgive and excuse people rather than condemn them to achieve the bond of perfect reconciliation. And for he knows our weaknesses, the perfection he demanded of us is relative perfection. Each one of us seeks it as per their capacity.